This is Joanne with Broadcast Sunny. This is part two of an interview with Stephen Loya. I put a camera over his shoulder so you can watch him make his creatures and discuss the techniques that help make them. Yeah, so, um, so right now I'm going to create a paint splotch and I have a few pre-made. These were made a while ago. Just using basic watercolors. Um, and your setup can be very advanced or it can be very basic. In this, this case, um, I'm outdoors. And I like to think that your studio could be pretty much anywhere, even though I have my own um, formal studio. It's just uh, a small room turned into a studio. Um, I like to think you could work anywhere. So right now I'm just getting these watercolors ready. Try not to think too much when I do these. A lot of people think you make these kind of in the style of Jackson Pollock where you just kind of throw paint and splatter it around. But, um, and I guess that is one approach that you can take, but mine is a little more careful. Sometimes I like to use contrasting colors. And then what I'll do sometimes, I'll just kind of let the color shift around and just kind of mix. kind of a nice effect doing that, although you don't have to. And if you want some nice texture, get some salt, any type of salt works. Just kind of gently sprinkle it and let it sit overnight and just brush it off. And you get a real nice kind of textural look. Very similar to this one here. This is where salt used to be. And you just brush it off. You could use your fingers. You could use a paintbrush. And lately I've really gone into having uh, the Splotch Monsters interact. So instead of having just one, which is kind of how I started out, I like to have kind of multiple. Splotch monsters, so you have some kind of um, some kind of dynamic. And really, anyone can do this. I'm not the originator of these. They've been called different things, and I've seen people take different approaches. And you could use cheap watercolor paints, you could use, I think these are old Winsor Newton. But I try not to think too much when I do these. We'll take this out by <laughs> my talking, but my uh, sister does um, pixelating the, mm -hmm. the, the, the dots. Yeah. And she's like, just start, and you'll see where it goes. <laughs> and I start, and like, uh, it, no idea. You know, it, it takes some practice, and um, you almost have to get in the frame of mind, just kind of letting it happen, you know, and, and then seeing where it leads. So... So these would dry overnight. You can let them dry as long as you want, but I wouldn't recommend um, working on them right away. But I now usually how do you take oh, them, so, um, how, uh -huh. how do you take them home? Um, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, very carefully. But yeah, so start working on some of these. This is a dried one. 
Yeah, so these are some dried paint splotches. Um, I made these a while ago, just dug them out recently. And, um, you know, I get a lot of my ideas from real life animals, from aquatic life, sea life, um, reptiles, insects, um, and monster movies. <laughs> so, and whatever just comes to mind. So, um, while this is both a relaxing um, way of making art and being creative, there's a lot of decisions involved. And I usually have to look at it and turn it quite a few ways before I decide what I'm going to do. Sometimes it takes longer than other times. And being a teacher is interesting because I'll get a lot of input from students as far as what to do. And I find that's very helpful and kind of refreshing um, to hear what um, kids have to say. Uh, what I'm using here, these are called Pigma Micron pens. Um, I love them because you can get all kinds of different thicknesses. Um, they're archival, which is nice. They last a long time. And they're just really nice to work with. For some reason I see a beak or a bird-like creature. And maybe it's because I hear birds behind me right now. <laughs> but that's what I'm going with. Now what's neat sometimes, these little like gaps, these little holes can be turned into things. So that could be an eye or an ear. Even this little tiny one could be suggestive of the beginning of an eye. I like to add a lot of things like sp spots and stripes. And if you look at the natural world, you see all kinds of patterns in animals and wildlife. Especially a lot of tropical animals. And once you start adding these things, they really start to come alive. Let's give this guy a little tongue too. And we'll make it look a little more three dimensional. And I find it's important to add these little details like wrinkles and folds. A lot of times I'll look to see where an angle is and just from there create lines to make these wrinkles and folds. And this is the other front leg is getting shaded in completely because it doesn't get much light and it adds a sense of dimension. Now you can make a background, you can make splotch monsters in some kind of environment um, or just have them kind of free free floating on a white space. I'm kind of a minimalist in that respect so I don't mind it even though I tell my students to fill up all the white space. <laughs> fill these in. I'm not going to use them. And the nice thing about monsters is you can't mess up. You know, you could 
pretend you meant to do something even though it might not be what you intended. Sometimes you have to be okay with it because when you're working with paint and pens, you really can't reverse it, unlike with um, pencil. So you just kind of have to pretend you meant to do it. very fine lines with a 005 micron. I used to outline my splotch monsters but not so much anymore. So here's where I have to decide what to do with this back part. So it might be something that walks on its hind legs but is kneeling, almost like a human. Maybe it's hiding. And I'm going to try to keep the claws consistent in the back with the ones in the front to make it a little more believable. But that's not necessary. You don't have to do that. It actually looks like he's flying. It could, yeah, it could be flying. Maybe add wings or something. It is kind of a bird-like creature, so That's probably what that, I was that makes sense, yeah. Or even leaping. Mm. But yeah, I do like the flying idea. Again, I love getting suggestions and, and hearing what other people say. And it's neat to see how um, grown adults, you know, they'll look at some of these things that I make and they'll literally act out some of the things they see. It's pretty funny. They'll, they'll go from very serious to just kind of losing themselves and their imagination. Did you ever think of getting a booth in like Awesome Con or... Um, I haven't tried for Awesome Con yet. It's just it looks a little crazy <laughs> for my liking. But um, you know, I've had I've done quite a few um, First Fridays, and um, I'm, I'll be doing some craft fairs coming up at Artist or not Artisphere, but um, Art Enables in Washington D.C. Um, and I've done some things at Artisphere in Arlington. a lot of fun, get a lot of exposure and meet a lot of new people. You know I'm also thinking? Um, the Renaissance Fair, I can see this going well. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's amazing how it could just kind of, um, all the different demographics, you know, and groups of people that could get into it, sci-fi, you know. Hmm. I think a lot, you know, I've always been a Star Wars fan. Sci-fi fantasy yeah. hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And I've done, you know, much larger compositions that kind of verged on more abstraction. Um, you know, just really taking these to another level. But, you know, in the end, I think I have the most fun just doing these little, smaller ones. If you would like to see part one of the interview with Stephen Loya, check it out. If you would like to see other artists on the Western Loudoun Artist Studio Tour, check out the WLAS playlist on the Broadcast Sunny channel.